Uh, great. Uh, so I'll be talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, rate rhythm control overall. And uh, so uh, I'll, I'll run you through where we are in the guidelines, and I, I'm going to editorialize a fair amount in terms of what my practice is. Uh, so this is the latest document uh, regarding overall treatment. I'll talk about the 2017 AFib guidelines that just, uh, ablation guidelines that just came out. But this is regarding the overall management. So I've highlighted the issues about rate control, and a lot of this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, basically uh, beta blockers, non-dihydropyridine, uh, uh, calcium channel blockers are used for rate control. But what about, what are our goals? So this is listed as a 2A um, rate control that is at rest a heart rate goal of less than 80. Um, but what about more lenient strategy? And so I put in the bottom uh, there uh, a trial called RACE2, which looked at lenient or strict control. And as you can see that basically there was no statistical significant uh, difference. In fact, maybe um, uh, lenient control was a little better in terms of outcomes. And so that's listed as a 2B indication, uh, less than 110. So I think that remains a consideration as to are we um, over-rate controlling many people? Uh, they come in with fatigue because we've uh, now um, made them very bradycardic and sinus for the PAF patients, et cetera. So I think that becomes a real consideration that we uh, do consider in, in daily practice. AV node ablation, I think we do much less of than we used to, and it's a class three indication in terms of you must try other rate control agents first. So this is the overall view. You can see that most of the agents are used uh, pretty interchangeably in most of the disorders. Uh, the, the major limitation, that being of uh, LV dysfunction or heart failure, where we avoid um, uh, calcium channel blockers generally. What about rhythm control? And so this is a conversion. So the guidelines indicate flecainide, dofetilide, propofenone, or IV ibutilide are useful for uh, rhythm control and conversion. And then uh, in, as 2A, uh, we're considered either oral amiodarone for pharmacologic conversion or a pill in the pocket. And the, the caveat indicated is that this should be observed to be safe in a monitor setting, typically an e emergency department kind of setting before uh, going ahead and, and recommending a routine pill of the pocket. A dofetilide uh, limited uh, to in initiation um, in the hospital. So what about this whole issue of then deciding ablation? And that's what I'll kind of concentrate on. Uh, so class one indication as you've seen here is really that of symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation uh, that has been uh, refractory or intolerant uh, to typical uh, medical therapy. So that's the highest in terms of the classification. And I think that remains such in most of our practices. But what about expansion of this? And so when you look at the 2A indications, it extends to symptomatic persistent AFib that's been refractory intolerant to class one or three agents. So why the difference? Why was persistent included in the 2A and paroxysmal in the, cla in the class one? Well, again, it's, I think, recognition of benefit. The benefit, as we'll talk about further, is greater in paroxysmal atrial relations, higher success rates for single procedures, and that remains to today. The other part of it is the second point in class 2A. It says that uh, catheter ablation for symptomatic uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is an alternative. So for the first, you know, one of the first times, it can be first line therapy, and that's a 2A indication. Uh, so that is also acceptable overall. So this is the schema that was given to us in terms of that. You see, uh, again, the possibility of going to catheter ablation early uh, versus going through multiple uh, forms of drug therapy, anaerobic drug therapy. What about surgical therapy? We have a few surgeons in the, in the room here, I understand. Um, so what about that? So 2A, in fact, some of the early uh, uh, guidelines did not even include uh, cardiac surgery. So I think most of us were very delighted to see that it's reasonable uh, in patients undergoing cardiac surgery. And that's changed a little bit, as you'll see in the uh, 2017 guidelines. 
Speaking of the 2017 guidelines, these were, these were um, uh, released last month. Uh, you can see that similar kind of a tier level for symptomatic AFib refractory to at least one drug. So it's class one still for paroxysmal AFib, class 2A still for persistent, and then longstanding, again, a recognition that longstanding persistent AFib catheter ablation has even a lower success rate. It's a 2B now. So that's the kind of the tier thinking we have in terms of uh, in a, uh, use of uh, catheter ablation in these settings. This is what I refer to, that is, this is titled uh, concomitant, such as mitral valve surgery in atrial fibrillation. And now symptomatic AFib is a class one indication. So I think, again, a recognition that there is a role for um, uh, surgical treatment in concomitant surgery, where they're having a, a, a uh, valve procedure uh, or other uh, cardiac procedure. So uh, again, I think a call out to an important uh, new uh, emphasis uh, for surgical ablation in our field. Okay. But we're left to the, with this dilemma. Okay, what about rhythm control versus rate control? And then what's the overall picture? So I pulled out a, a, a study from the NCDR Pinnacle, which my colleague Mintu Taraki is a co-author on. And so it gives us some uh, real world, um, uh, I think, uh, insights into what is really being done. Um, and so you see here, and this is over about a half a million patients with atrial fibrillation. This is a, a diverse population. Uh, but you see that three quarters were um, not treated with rhythm control. And that's what it's described, um, leaving um, uh, about a, a you know, 20 so percent uh, with rhythm control. Of those, uh, that is, of the people who were in rhythm control, ablation was only used in 13%. So you see that ablation is really, uh, over this time period, has remained uh, a relatively modest proportion in terms of our therapy. So uh, you may get a very different picture in many of the tertiary care, care centers represented here where you think, well, everybody gets ablated, uh, don't they? Uh, but clearly the real world says something very different about uh, this. And some of the interesting insights in terms of that this paper provided, I think, were some of the factors. And so those are some of the things listed here. Um, there are a number of things that were predictors of the use of rhythm control. So if you're younger, male gender, white race, for example, private insurance, a number of factors that are both medical and non-medical, you could argue, uh, were uh, basically important in determining who is going to get rhythm control. And this is further seen when you see who gets catheter ablation as well. So these are a uh, number of factors that I think we as a field have to kind of grapple with. How are we making these decisions? Probably not really based on people in this room, but the overall group of people who see patients with atrial fibrillation, how are they making these decisions? And so that's really, I think, a call out to our field uh, broadly, uh, that is, of non-cardiologists, of trying to educate them and understand what decision makings and options there are, uh, particularly as our therapies advance. The other comment I would say is that when you look at uh, successes that are quoted in trials, I would say single center successes are dramatically higher than that when, when you start getting multi-center trials. And I think some of the lowest are those which are multi-center FDA trials. Uh, I personally regard FD, multi-center FDA trials as some of our best trials, uh, meaning that they're least likely to be selected, and, but still very high quality data. So you really have to kind of wonder when you look at single center studies, even very large, robust ones from outstanding centers, is that reproducible across uh, the country? And are you generalizing when you're basing your uh, guidelines and clinical practice on those studies? So I'll kind of guide you through where we are in terms of ablation and success. And you can see on this, you know, kind of a slide some of the, you know, what's happened over the years. Well, 60% has become 70%, you know, that kind of range uh, up until probably about, you know, five or six years ago. This is the latest, uh, this is uh, published the last year. Uh, uh, called Fire and Ice, uh, comparing two of our latest technologies. Cryo balloon, as many of you know, has increased at a much more rapid rate than I think most people can, uh, estimated, and now has an increasing proportion of the, of the overall uh, world um, experience and U.S. experience with catheter ablation. And this study was really the first large randomized multicenter trial comparing radiofrequency and cryoablation. 
And as you see, the take-home message is that they were non-inferior. You see, though, that the success overall was about 60 to 65 percent um, at you know, uh, one year's time, so not you know, something like 80 or 90 percent either, as you see uh, in this um, you know, group of quite experienced centers. When you look further, is there a difference in generation? Yes, probably so. That is, the more advanced technology does seem to have a benefit, but still maybe only a modest one, getting you up to 70% compared to uh, 60 or so. When you look at other endpoints, there is somewhat of a uh, benefit of cryoablation versus radiofrequency, that is, all-cause hospitalization cardiovascular hospitalization or freedom from repeat ablation, there is some uh, benefit seen for cryoablation. But yet this has to be reproduced in mu multiple other centers, I think, and studies in the future. Okay. This is another, um, uh, this is called a post-market uh, approval FDA uh, study. As you know, the FDA has required, uh, in addition to the initial pivotal studies, more and more studies that are uh, needed uh, in terms of uh, post-approval. And this gives you a look at probably 80% freedom from AT, atrial tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, and flutter um, uh, at one year. So we're seeing some increase going from the 60 to 70, probably up to the 80% in PAF. The next biggest controversy is what can we do? Uh, what's the best strategy, that is? Uh, is it anatomic, like pulmonary vein ablation, which we've seen in the previous uh, slides on uh, radiofrequency and catheter ablation, or is there a way to map um, atrial fibrillation. So this is, I think, one of our biggest challenges in terms of answering this question. Uh, this uh, slide I show here is actually on an interesting um, ex vivo study. These are explanted human hearts at the time of heart transplantation and have done some very nice optical mapping that tries to demonstrate, yes, there is some ability to uh, map atrial fibrillation. And that remains a big question, what can we do clinically? Can we actually do that in a clinical way? This is a slide provided by my colleague, Sandy Ryan, who developed uh, this. And you can see on the up, upper left panel, you can see this little red dot moving around. It's like one of those dots you read, you know, you're trying to sing along. And you're kind of looking at to see how that moves. And instead of being kind of scattered, you see the ability to be able to track this. Um, like the so-called eye of the storm. And so this is the whole principle of this so-called firm uh, mapping that has been done, focal impulse and rotor mapping, which is now being studied to guide uh, um, uh, catheter ablation. And there are a number of studies underway, and we're waiting for those uh, multicenter trials to be done. Um, this is a very important trial that looked at persistent AFib, but one of the key issues here was, uh, can we do more than pulmonary vein isolation? I think generally the field has said, yeah, for sure. Things that you do beyond pulmonary vein isolation always seem to benefit. Now, this is a major randomized trial that looked at this, um, and it showed no benefit uh, beyond uh, pulmonary vein isolation. So I think the, the um, jury's still out as what are the different things that we can do to improve outcomes, and that's part of the next uh, discussion. This is the work of uh, using a so-called hybrid surgical catheter ablation. Uh, again, um, uh, non-randomized, but show the potential for persistent in, uh, atrial fibrillation to be treated with higher degree of success with this so-called combined, uh, reaching uh, successes of about 80 to 90 percent uh, off a uh, drug. So, so what are some of the take-home messages? Uh, atrial fibrillation symptoms can be reduced uh, by catheter ablation. The second degree uh, generation success has probably increased further, probably in the 80 plus, not 80 plus percent. Uh, there are patient populations that remain challenges. Persistent AFib, long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, large outlift atrial sizes, and that success may be 50%. We need to learn much more about uh, mapping that may improve success in the future. Um, risk modification, which we'd love to talk about, also has a large impact, that is weight reduction, sleep apnea treat treatment, and other techniques such as hybrid surgical ablation may have some promise for the future. Thank you very much.